Namaste. So the discussion on our WhatsApp group is getting off to a good start. We already have some very interesting questions from Venkatesh. And I'm going to make this video, this is an exclusive video for the community members. Uh, because after all, Venkatesh has these questions like everybody's going to have it. So let's dive in and see um, how we can address these questions effectively. Now, first of all, yeah, I want to make an introduction. Language is awkward. Language is an inefficient way of teaching spirituality. Practice is much better than precept. In other words, don't think about it, just do it. And everything will become clear all by itself. So these questions are really about language and the awkwardness of language and the incompleteness of language in expressing spiritual concepts. For one thing, language has changed a lot since Vedic times, since the days of the Rishis. Now, back in the days, huh, before the Vedas were even written down, they were an oral tradition. Well, what does that mean? You have to approach a teacher, sit down, and listen. That's one of the meanings. That's the external meaning of Upanishad. Upa-ani-shat. Come close and sit down and listen. To do that, you have to have a personal relationship, isn't it? There's no way you can do it through a medium like books or what to speak of internet and like that. So this tradition originally is a spoken tradition in a person-to-person -person relationship not mediated by any kind of media. That's what, you know, we media are. They're intermediaries. They come between the speaker and the hearer. And that is precisely the problem here. That is actually the origin of the questions here. <clears throat> that we have all read many, many books and heard many, many videos or whatever, podcasts and so on. And they all use terminology differently. They all define their terms differently according to their lineage, their background. So right away, I have to state right in the beginning, we follow Shankaracharya. All of our videos in all of our series are based upon or make reference to or uh, exist in the context of Sripad Adi Shankaracharya's purports or commentaries on Vedanta Sutra, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, etc. All the written topics that he expressed. This means we use a certain set of definitions for these terms regarding everything, especially Aupurusheya, beyond human, direct human intelligence or perception. Those are, appear to us as inferences. And so we can attack them on, you know, all the well-known uh, points of uh, making inferences about things that we don't directly understand. But see, in the old days, these things were taught by analogy, by metaphor, by stories, examples. So the most famous one is the rope and the snake, right? Someone goes out at night, maybe he's a little drunk, or maybe he's half asleep on the way to the toilet or something, and he sees a rope. Actually, he sees... He sees a snake, but it isn't a snake, it's a rope. And when someone comes with a light, immediately the reality is revealed, 
and poof, the illusion disappears. That is a seminal example, a seminal metaphor. And in old days, anyone who heard this would understand it immediately. But since the days when the Vedas were written down by Vyasadeva, around 5,000 years ago, many other spiritual literatures have been authored on their basis. And we made a video here some time ago about how the um, Vedic literature is divided and how it emanates from the four original Vedas. You should know this because the terminology used in the four original Vedas and of course the Upanishads within them is not the language of the later scriptures such as the Puranas, Itihasas, Tantras, and so on. That language is much more literal and even though it's in the form of stories, the tendency in modern life in general, of course, the, due to the influence of English and German uh, internationally, is that we tend to take them literally. But they're not meant to be taken literally. Huh? Just like when I put up this chart on the four types of consciousness, the four states of consciousness, whatever you want to call it, most people are inclined to view them as, you know, cut and dried categories, levels, and so on like that. It's not at all like that. Not at all. Uh, by necessity, these definitions are all rather fuzzy. They don't have clearly defined boundaries. They overlap. They merge into one another in you know, ways that we might not predict according to linear thinking. So first of all, the linear approach or interpretation, the literal approach and interpretation of the scriptures has to be dropped. And one should understand that these are stories meant to convey certain ideas, certain concepts. It doesn't matter if they're historically true or not. In fact, <laughs> from a writer's point of view, it's better if they're not historically true because that would dilute the purity or accuracy of the metaphor. See, if you're just making up a metaphor out of whole cloth or out of whole akasha, <laughs> you can do whatever you want. And of course, the reason for that is the value or the potency of a metaphor is only as good as the number of points it holds in similarity with the thing that it's trying to describe. So, what is a story? A story is a model. A model is a metaphor. A metaphor is a description of something in words but the thing itself, the thing that it's describing, is an experience, not a tangible object. Well, of course, it's tangible to the person having the experience. <laughs> and that's the purpose of these tales, is to give you an idea what it's like in higher states of consciousness. Of course, it can't be described explicitly, exactly, precisely and so on. <laughs> but the metaphor gives a clue as to how the whole thing should work. So, all right. The first question is on Jagrat and Svapna. Regarding the differentiation of Jagrat and Svapna, while Svapna, which is filtering out the external, is understandable, why is Jagrat, which is extroverted consciousness, regarded as filtering internal objects? When a person is Jagrat, is he not aware of his inner thoughts and mind as he is aware of the external world? I find Jagrat filtering out internal objects difficult and contradictory to understanding. Well, that's because the definitions of the states of consciousness 
Jagrat, Svapna, Sushupti, etc. are, in terms of their objects, actually consciousness is one. But our attention can be aimed in different directions or even several directions at once. Actually, all four states of consciousness are functioning and available all the time. But our attention wanders from one to another. And that's why we apparently see changes. Huh? We apparently see a snake. <laughs> but actually, it's a rope. All four states are going all the time, and you can access any of them at any time by an appropriate effort of will. And we'll get to that later. Now, Jagrat means you're looking out through the senses at the world. Now, anybody who is good at something, I mean really good at something, could be ice skating, could be dancing, could be martial arts, could be playing a musical instrument, could be meditation. Huh? <laughs> Anyone who is really good at something got that way by training their mind to focus all their attention on what they're doing. So if my attention is focused on, let's say, um, playing an instrument in a jazz combo, things are happening way too fast for me to think about it. You have to train your body, train your um, internal muscle reflexes to be able to follow a very fast-moving, fast-changing situation. So in that state of being in the flow of, let's say, you know, skateboarding or skiing or swimming or whatever it is, you do not think. You don't have time to think. Thinking is much slower than the impressions of the senses which come in by the hundreds every second. So that's why Jagrat is defined as, see, these are extremes. When the attention is directed completely externally through the senses, that's Jagrat. Yes, when our attention is divided, we can think and do stuff at the same time. And that's probably most people's normal state these days. They're doing stuff around the house and they're simultaneously remembering the TV show they watched last night or whatever. So they are aware of both Jagrat and Svapna. But then when we go to sleep at night, we drop Jagrat and we focus exclusively on Svapna, which is within. So Svapna is defined in the extreme as awareness of internal objects. The uh, antakarna, the internal organ, which is really a grab bag for a bunch of different internal functions like the mind, memory, reason, language, and so on. Imagination, that's a really important one. Will, I mean ego, everything internal of the individual is in the antakarna. So when our attention is focused exclusively on that, that's svapna. And so, yes, we can have mixed attention. It can be directed in more than one state of consciousness at a time. See, that this is one of the problems with language and with diagrams. <laughs> it looks as though jagrat and svapna are mutually exclusive, but they're not. They go on simultaneously, and we can be aware of them simultaneously. And then the question two is about upadis. Are the upadis in any particular ascending order? That is, is Turiya the highest state and Jagrat the lowest state of consciousness? Is it a scale? Yes. If yes, <laughs> how is Svapna state any better than Jagrat state of consciousness, or are all the Upadis independent of each other? It's not an either or. Again, this is not linear, literal thinking. 
All these categories overlap, interpenetrate, join in different ways, and so on. But yes, in general, Swapna is superior to Jagrat. Why? Well, just think of all the inventions and discoveries and art and so many things that make human beings more intelligent, more capable, and also more comfortable than any other animal. Huh? Any of the other Pashu. <laughs> so, all these things were developed in the mind through imagination, through creativity, through dreams, because svapna means awareness of dreams and thoughts. Dreams are thoughts. Thoughts are dreams. There's no real difference. So to the degree that we are aware of the uh, higher functions of the mental state, that is our power of creativity as a scientist, as an engineer, as a artist, as a meditator, even so on. Just think of the eight jhanas defined by the Buddha. These are all exercises in will and imagination. So we'll get to that later, or actually we have got to it in earlier videos, but I digress. Upadis are more or less independent. Yes, they can exist simultaneously. They can overlap. They can combine to spawn sub-upadis and so on. Uh, just like the example about subtractive color filters. At the end of the presentation, the PDF, I put a link in the description if you don't see it. Um, the subtractive colors, when they mix form a third color. And when those mix with other adjacent colors, they, they form tertiary and quaternary and so on, layers of different shades of color. So in the same way, the upadis being basically three, according to the trigunya, the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, they interact, intermix, and spawn many, many, many uh, different combinations of flavors, what have you. And these also can combine with others and so on. I mean, <laughs> this is what's meant as the ocean of the material world. And when one crosses that ocean, one gets actual experience of consciousness and realizes what consciousness is then all these questions are, you know, silly, <laughs> obvious too. But um, up until that point, we have to discuss these things to make it all clear. Next question is on action and Maya. Maya. There is one more slide on Maya, which says action is a type of Maya. How can action be Maya when karma yogis and Lord Krishna says to Arjun to carry out his actions, how can action be considered Maya? Isn't inaction Maya? Well, it depends. <laughs> See, here you have an example of a, a scripture written in later times in more linear language, um, more literal language, uh, even though it's in a form of a story, within the story are many technical points that people take absolutely linearly, uh, literally, as if they're scientific chemical formulas or something. They're not. They're states of being. An action is something done through an instrument, such as the body, or words, or the mind, to attain a certain result. That means it comes from a desire. Desire is an upadi that covers the completeness of Brahman. See, Brahman actually contains everything that anybody could ever desire. And when one realizes Brahman, all desires are fulfilled. 
Uh, Brahman has no desires because anything that he could desire is already part of him. So there are no desires in Brahman. Desire is an upadi that blocks out the fact that Brahman is completely satiated at all times. Self-satisfied, Atma-Rama. So when we follow a desire and when we base an action on a desire, that's maya. <laughs> We're trying to kill the snake <laughs> or capture it. But it's not a snake, it's a rope. So everything that we could ever want is there in Brahman. This is why always the Vedas, Vedic literatures are preaching uh, restraint of desires, tapasya, ahimsa. That way, we gradually reduce the desires until they are less, they're not going to drown out Brahman anymore. Because, of course, we have access to Brahman all the time. But Brahman gets covered over by these upadis, and then we forget. And we think, oh, I need this, I need that, I gotta have this, I gotta do that, I gotta go there. I have to know this. See, these are all actions, and actions are ignorance. Why? Because they lead to karma. An action is a cause. It's designed to produce a certain effect. But of course, because we're ignorant, see, that's the first maya, is ignorance, and we desire something, then we, t we take action to get it, we create a bunch of other effects that we didn't intend. And these unintended consequences are karma. Any complex system has unpredictable outputs. You ought to know this as an engineer. So every complex system has innumerable, unknowable failure modes. So this is why action leads to suffering because it creates additional upadis called karma. These are unattended consequences of the act of will aimed at satisfying that desire. So when you understand how all this works, it's absolutely clear. Huh? It's when you're lost in a jungle of words and different literatures, different writers uh, define them differently and use them differently, um, it's impossible to really f get clarity. You have to do the work. You have to do the sadhana. Then clarity will come. Finally, a question on methods. The last slide mentions the methods of attaining specific consciousness, wherein Raja Yoga is for Sushupti, Pratyahara, and Dharana for Svapna, and Pranayama for Jagrat. But, here is the doubt, Raja Yoga, Ashtanga Yoga contains Pranayama, Pratyahara, and Dhyana, when both Raja Yoga and Pratyahara Dharana, Dhyana and Pranayama are part of the same subset, how can they be linked with different types of consciousness? This is the same problem. Patanjali Yoga Sutras define these things as part of a scale, beginning with Namaniyam, and then asana, pranayama, pratyahara, and so on, leading to self-realization. How does Patanjali define yoga? Yogaha, chitta vritti nirodaha. Chitta vritti nirodaha, the cessation of the modifications of the mind stuff. Modifications means exactly the same thing as upadi. See, what is in Shankara's language called upadis, in the language of the Upanishads, in the language of yoga tradition, is called chitta vrittis. Vritti means modification. It's the same thing. 
So when these are nirodaha, when they are completely uh, stopped, that is yoga. Yoga is defined negatively. Brahman is also defined negatively in the Upanishads as neti neti. Not this, not this, not this, not this. And this is also a form of meditation, just like Chitta Vritti Nirodaha is actually a direction of a form of meditation. It's an instruction. Sit down, try it, do it. And you will gain this prize, this result, this attainment called yoga. Yoga means linking. And Bhagavad Gita says, yoga yukta prasanatma. When one is linked in yoga, linked with what? With the Supreme, with Brahman. Prasanatma, he has happiness in his being. He has happiness in his essence, in his consciousness. Not so chati, not kangshati. He doesn't <laughs> lament. <laughs> in fact, he laughs at the lament lamentations of the world because they're all due to desire. Huh? Not kangshati. He doesn't desire to have anything. That's the key. That's the secret. Uh, so don't get all hung up on these different terms. I mean, you know, you talk about Ashtanga Yoga, but look at the places that teach Ashtanga Yoga or claim to teach Ashtanga Yoga. Mostly they're teaching asana. There may be a little bit of pranayama. And of course, nama and niyama are nowhere to be seen. <laughs> So they're starting on step three and trying to go higher, but they, they don't ever teach pratyahara, withdrawing the mind from the senses. What to speak of the other concentration and meditation and samadhi. They don't teach samadhi. They don't know what samadhi is. They don't practice samadhi. They don't understand samadhi when they read about it in books. They can't do even pratyahara because they have no internal object in svapna on which to concentrate the attention and withdraw it from jagrat. But because they don't know the structure of consciousness, they don't read the Upanishads. They don't practice the actual Vedic yoga so they don't know any of these things. They are just speculating based on words. And of course, all their conclusions are wrong. That's why, see, these people are actually frauds. They're saying, we teach Ashtanga Yoga, but they teach nothing of that. They teach at most, what? Trishanga Yoga. <laughs> Three legs out of eight. Now, well, three out of eight, I guess that's pretty good <laughs> for Kali Yuga. But it's not the actual Ashta Anga. Ashta means eight, Anga means limbs. So it's not the original eight limbed yoga. This is why, you know, their, their claims are actually fraudulent. But whatever we are claiming, actually, if you sit down, and you try to realize it, if you observe yourself, explore yourself, you will find that all of these things are exactly the way we describe, because our description, uh, as Shankaracharya's description, as the Upanishad's description, is based on experience, based on practice. Yes, we have to have a theory, we have to have something written, but it's never going to express the thing, the real, the way it really is, huh? Like, how does the beginning of Tao Te Ching go? The Tao that can be spoken is not the original Tao. The truth that can be spoken is not actually the truth. Can't be, because words are upadis. <laughs> They're part of Swapna. They're dreams. So only if you can bring your dream into reality, only if you can experience what you think in 
Jagrat consciousness in the body, actualize it and experience it for yourself, then it's true. Then you understand. Until then, uh, <laughs> it's just based on words and it's more or less speculation. So I hope I answered these questions. We have more, of course, we have much more on consciousness in our channel. And I put a link to our video catalog in the description below, as well as some other materials. So uh, you can get started looking at those. Thank you very much for your participation. This is going to be a short video, right? <laughs> Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti Aum. Om Namah Shivaya. <laughs>